Imagine what it's like from a young age to feel you're trapped in the wrong body. That your biological sex is at odds with what gender you feel. For a growing number of young people, this mismatch results in serious distress. In medicine, it has a name, gender dysphoria. It can start at a very young age. And it means that for some, the onset of puberty can become a traumatic experience as their bodies develop in a direction they don't want them to go. You feel out of place, you feel odd, and you feel disturbed every time you look into the mirror. But people are increasingly starting to question one key treatment offered to young people who are struggling with their gender identity. It is unacceptable to have lower standards of care for a group that are already marginalised and stigmatised. Newsnight has learnt that data suggesting that self-harm increased after young people started a controversial medical treatment weren't taken into consideration when it came to an important policy decision about its use. In the English NHS, children with gender dysphoria are referred to the Gender Identity Development Service, GIDS, at London's Tavistock and Portman Trust. Referrals have increased from 97 to 2,590 a year in the space of a decade. The reasons for this are unclear. Gender clinics around the world use puberty blocking drugs to stop the development of secondary sex characteristics, so periods, breasts, Adam's apples and breaking voices. These blockers work on the brain to stop the eventual release of oestrogen and testosterone, the sex hormones that increase during puberty. The idea is the drugs pause puberty and allow children and their families time to think, to explore their gender identity without the additional distress of their bodies changing. These drugs aren't actually licensed to treat gender dysphoria, that's not unusual in healthcare. But when drugs are used beyond their intended purpose, the new use may not be supported by robust research. For years, no one under 16 could get puberty blockers on the NHS. But in 2011, this came under review. JIDS, alongside University College London Hospitals, began a study which looked at the effects of blockers on younger children who had only just begun puberty, around the age of 12. Several clinics around the world were already doing this, but the evidence was limited. Michael Biggs is an Oxford University sociologist who has raised concerns about this area, attracting criticism from some in the transgender community for his views. He gave Newsnight a series of documents relating to the research study he'd obtained via Freedom of Information requests, including something called a protocol. So here's the protocol. It guides the conduct and the design of the study, how many people it will recruit, how long it will last and what outcomes it's measuring. It also pulls together what is already known from the scientific literature. We've had these documents independently looked at. Experts Newsnight has consulted are critical about how the study was set up. It didn't have a control group to compare results with and what they'd set out to study wasn't very clear. It means that it's hard to know if the observed effects are due to the puberty blockers or something else. Participants in the study were given an information sheet. It lists what are deemed to be the potential risks associated with the treatment. It included uncertainty about how blockers will affect bone strength, brain function and fertility. Newsnight can reveal that potentially significant scientific data were missing from both the protocol and the participant information sheet. Before a study gets going, researchers should survey what's already out there and make any existing evidence known. A Dutch study had already suggested this. No adolescent withdrew from puberty suppression and all started cross-sex hormone treatment. 
rather than providing time and space to think, as parents and children have been told, all young people who took blockers went on to take cross-sex hormones, the next step towards fully transitioning to the opposite gender. Professor Biggs thinks this information should have been on the information sheet written for the children and parents taking part in the study. I don't see that the parents and their children had re could really have given informed consent, given the lack of information that was provided. They were not given uh, the information they needed in order to take this momentous, life-changing uh, step. Let's talk about guinea pig. What I mean by guinea pig is you're pretty much testing blockers. One person who's made that decision is Hannah Phillips. She didn't take part in this study, but has shared her experiences at JIDS on YouTube. At 16, she began taking puberty blockers. She said she was told how little was known about the treatment and any potential risks, but wanted to go ahead anyway. No one really questions whether or not it's harmful to your body. I think we're just so young that we just kind of just trust the doctors. For me, I don't think there could have been anything that the doctors could have said to stop me from wanting to go on to hormone blockers. Now, hormone blockers have been a thing for quite some time. Like they After 15 months on like blockers, Hannah began taking cross-sex hormones, oestrogen in her case. When I started blockers, they suggested that there would be some time between starting blockers and starting hormones. I didn't really see it as a time frame to just think about my options. I saw it as the first step to this journey. We don't know why children taking puberty blockers tend to actually go on to transition, but here's director of JIDS, Polly Carmichael, speculating why several years after the study started. So I guess there is a question about why so many, you know, why none? None stop once they've started on the blocker, more or less. And so I guess that begs the question that either we're not putting forward enough young people for this, that there are some people who would benefit from this, who are missing out on this treatment, or that in some way this treatment in and of itself may have an impact and set people on a path. Jids declined an interview but told us... We are confident that informed consent was obtained. They added... Our lead paediatric endocrinologist always raised the possibility that blocking puberty may crystallise gender identity. The full results of the study haven't been published, but public statements from JIDS about the progress of the study have been wholly enthusiastic, Polly Carmichael telling the Daily Mail in 2014 the results thus far have been positive. At some point that year, NHS England approved a change in JID's policy, even though the study had only just finished recruiting participants. The service was now free to give puberty blockers to those just beginning puberty who were not part of the study. Michael Biggs found some preliminary data for 30 of the 44 young people taking part in the study. They were presented to the Tavistock board by Polly Carmichael in 2015, a year after the policy change. One finding flagged up by JIDS and UCLH researchers themselves was what it described as a significant increase in those agreeing to the statement, I deliberately try to hurt or kill myself. This was the outcomes only after one year. And after one year on puberty blockers, there were a lot of things that the children got worse in several respects. So uh, the most disturbing aspect of that was that the children reported a higher level of self-harm. And that, to me, raises a, 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 very, uh, a very big red, red flag. Understandably, this all sounds very negative. But strangely enough, in medical research, we can't literally interpret them that way because of flaws in the study design. We can't infer cause and effect. Nevertheless, these observations should have given JIDS pause for thought. Professor Susan Bewley is an expert in women's health and writes clinical guidelines for NICE. She's one of a number of doctors who are raising concerns about the lack of evidence in this area of medicine. Seeing a change in suicidality is very worrying. We know that this is an outcome. We don't know how to make it get better or get worse. 
and we've got form in medicine of having bad science where we've given treatments that have increased suicide in teenagers before, it is really important to do good ethical research in this area. Good medical practice would normally be very reflective about an increase in harms. Jids told Newsnight that these numbers are far too small to draw final conclusions and said all patients were regularly seen by mental health professionals and they thought continuation of the study was appropriate. The HRA, that's the Health Research Authority, is a public body that's supposed to make sure research is ethical and transparent. It requires researchers to provide annual progress reports in which they're advised to include any concerns that have arisen about participant safety. Over a period of years, the HRA requested updates about the puberty blockers study, warning that ethical approval for it could be withdrawn. No updates were forthcoming, yet the HRA didn't carry out its threat. We showed the HRA the preliminary data that the Tavistock board had seen and shared our concerns about the study. They responded. The information that Newsnight has brought to our attention has not been raised with us before. We will therefore investigate further. They added they do not currently have all the information they need. They have reviewed minutes from the Ethics Committee that approved the study and these have not raised a specific concern. So why? given the lack of clear evidence about their safety, was the age limit JIDs used for puberty blockers reduced. It's not clear. According to NHS England, the policy change followed an evaluation of the study. Newsnight asked both JIDs and NHS England for a copy of this evaluation. We're still waiting. NHS England also said the policy change was based on international evidence and developed with clinical experts. Since the study began, 267 under 15s have been put on blockers. It is unacceptable to have lower standards of care for a group that are already marginalised and stigmatised. We must not miss the opportunity to do good research now. Helping a very good clinic with concerned clinicians actually deal with the uncertainty of what they're doing. I don't think they should pause the current rules on allowing young people to have access to puberty blockers, but I do reckon that there should be more research. Young people struggling with their gender identity are a vulnerable group, daunted, even distressed by having a developing body that doesn't reflect who they are and how they feel. JIDS is a place they feel listened to and understood. But this support should surely be based on the highest standards of healthcare and research. It's a subject that demands open and honest debate. <laughs>